In today's episode, Sue and I talk all about what foods are good, what foods are bad, and why you should have processed foods in your diet. Make sure you like, subscribe, share with a friend, and we'll see you on the inside. We are back here with Coach Courtney, and if you didn't catch her last episode with Alex talking about how you can own your world, then definitely go check that one out. We'll have it linked in the description box. But Courtney and I are both sporting the best sweats in the whole entire world. This is true. They are the story (laughs) backstory sweats, and I feel so bad because they haven't come back out with them or Mm -hmm. restocked, and I just keep saying how much I love them, and everyone's like, well, I can't buy them, and I feel bad. But I am glad that I personally own six pairs. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're building anticipation. It's I fine. Know. <laughs> It'll be it, there. Will the day will come? Oh, and I'm going to buy six more pairs, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Today we are going to be diving into the why behind nutrition goals, and I love that this podcast is with Courtney, and she has been praised multiple times by our whole team of how great you are at asking questions. And so, within <laughs> diving into the why behind nutrition, I really wanted to talk about what it looks like for just asking questions and why you do ask questions to learn the why. I think that by nature, I'm just a curious person. I remember being in school early on, realizing that many people had the same questions that I did. And so I just accepted that role um, because I wanted the answer. And I knew that getting the answer would help me adhere or you know complete the homework assignment better or get the better grade and understand why and set me up for success down the road. Because if I didn't fully understand something, then I didn't have as much confidence in what I was doing. And I realized if I just asked and got that answer, I'd have so much more clarity and a lot more peace moving forward. And I knew that it would help me navigate a similar situation down the road. And I figured if I'm in school with a teacher, they are an expert. So why not leverage that resource? So I've maintained that mentality and it's carried me through coaching coaching as well. And before I became a coach, I was a client myself. And um, going through my own health journey, there was a time when I realized I needed to be eating more to support my health, to support my activity level, um, to operate better as a body. But I was so fearful of just gaining unnecessary or unnecessary weight or excess body fat that I also knew wasn't necessarily healthy. But at the time, doctors, loved ones were saying, you need to put on weight. And to me, there was gaps. (laughs) And so that started me wanting to do self research and inevitably led me to hiring my first coach because I wanted someone, an expert, to be able to create that clarity for me and help me understand exactly what I should be doing instead of just guessing and maybe not reaping the result that I was looking for. Now, I know when it comes to asking questions, one thing that I struggle with and other people I've talked to struggle with is feeling like you're asking a stupid question or someone's going to think that you don't know what you're talking about. How do you combat that mentally? Because I honestly still struggle with that. And asking Alex a question on a client where I do need help and I need some guidance, but I don't want to admit or show that I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like If you don't know something, it's better to ask and maybe feel a little silly but not actually look stupid than to pretend like you know, make a decision that maybe impacts a client or something, and then have to circle back and admit a mistake or admit that you didn't know something previously. It's just more efficient, and I also think makes you look smarter to be honest from the get-go because it's going to bite you in the butt if you don't. (laughs) You have truly helped me so much because of the way that you ask me questions to just show that we're not supposed to know everything, and that's where even I feel like the imposter syndrome comes from of just feeling like you should know everything, and even if you are an expert in a field, you shouldn't ask someone else for help, and that is such a misconception of you need to ask for help. You need to ask questions to learn, to further your knowledge. And I love that you brought up within your own fitness journey. And if you haven't listened to Courtney's Coach Spotlight, I'll have that link down below. She talks more about her personal journey. I know when I started my own fitness journey, I was following what I saw online or what I thought was right. And I was too scared to ask questions. And I did do a lot of self-looking around, but I wasn't really diving into it. I was just looking for the answer that I wanted to be right. Mm -hmm. 
And within that, I ended up spinning my wheels a little bit too much when it came to fitness, and I didn't see the progress that I wanted to, and I felt like I was putting in so much effort and just not getting what I wanted out of it. So I love that you mentioned that because that's really why it's such a passion within physique development to educate clients because we know what it's like personally to go through it, feel so lost, to make mistakes Mm -hmm. and slow down your progress and possibly not make progress further because we've talked about it a number of times, but when it comes to uh, other coaching services or just other experiences, maybe you have good progress while you're there, but then you don't know how to facilitate that moving forward. And that's what we're going to be diving into today is the why behind nutrition goals. Why do we do what we do and why should you even care about some of these aspects? Exactly. And you're kind of alluding to this a little bit, but something I'm so passionate about is helping people understand the definition of true health. Being healthy is not just based on what you look like on the outside. To me, being healthy is being of sound body and mind. And that has to do with having a strong immune system, having great brain health and mental health, having great metabolism, having good gut health, having good energy, having good sleep, feeling calm and at peace. And having health at that level has a compounding effect because it influences your longevity. It influences your performance if you are exercising or an athlete, and it influences your satisfaction in life. Mm -hmm. It increases quality of life. And so as coaches, exactly as you said, I think it's our job to educate because we want people to build the knowledge and the skills and the awareness so that they can peacefully navigate life for the rest of their life without feeling uncertain or without those gaps. Because having gaps just doesn't feel good and it can make you second guess something. And we all know how helpful it can be to have a coach in your corner because they can look up things objectively. But ultimately, you want to get to the point where you can step back and view things objectively yourself. Um, So that you're not second guessing. And if you have the knowledge, you'll feel much more confident in guiding yourself through your health journey. Yeah. And within health, exactly what you said of it's not just a specific look. And another thing is showing how health applies to each person. And with the aspects that you mentioned here, when it comes to brain health, sleep, gut health, metabolic health, that can look so differently on different people and in different lifestyles. And it's not just a one definition. It's not just a one look. It's really being able to see how we can apply it to someone's lifestyle to allow them to have that peace and going forward because it's not one size fits all. Right. Totally. When starting off with this core of nutrition, I know that macros are very popular. And a lot of our clients count macros. I know I personally count macros, and so do you. But why should someone even care about macros? And won't it lead to just more restriction as they go through their health journey? That's such a common question, I think, from people kind of on the outside looking in. And what I will say is that tracking macros is not um perfect for everybody. It's not necessarily the right approach for everyone. And I have clients who don't track. I know that as a company, we have some clients who don't track. But for many people, tracking macros for a period of time can be extremely beneficial. And here's why. Um, I feel strongly in this. When people are beginning their health journey, if they don't have a lot of awareness about um, what's in their foods or how foods make them feel, they're going to feel more lost as they're trying to make these intentional decisions to get them to a goal. So by tracking macros, you learn so much about not only Mm -hmm. the calories in food, but the nutritional content of food, which is invaluable knowledge. And that can create an abundant mindset around food. It's not about restriction as much as it is about getting enough of the right nutrients to help your body function. And Tracking macros, I think over time, helps people realize there's not a one-size-fits-all way of approaching good nutrition. And frankly, I think that tracking macros help people, many people, realize that they can eat and enjoy a variety of foods while still improving their internal health and working towards a specific physique goal and moving the needle forward. So for me, um, it has provided more of that abundant mindset, and I think it's a shift in perspective. And although tracking macros undeniably requires more effort and more time, and at first it takes a lot of practice, but 
I believe that this short-term period of imbalance, if you will, helps people achieve the balance they're looking for long-term because of the knowledge and the confidence and the peace of mind that they'll gain. One thing I always love to say is consistency breeds flexibility. Mm. And within tracking macros, so much has to do with just getting reps in of learning about food so you can have so much more flexibility and knowledge around food. Because I know when I go out to eat, or even just within the dieting series that we're doing right now, people ask questions, how do you eat that and still stay on track? How do you go and enjoy that and still hit your macros? And it's not even a stress for me anymore. It definitely was in the beginning, but now eight years in, almost a decade into tracking, it's not stressful for me whatsoever. I have that ingrained knowledge of food. I know how to navigate any situation really and feel so confident that I don't have to have this stress. I don't have to have this worry of can I go and do this thing and still hit what I need to hit. I'm just able to go and enjoy it and be present because I have this knowledge of food. And that's what I always say to clients too is tracking allows you to build that knowledge and it builds over time just like you said. It's not something that just is so easy right when you start off. It's a, it's Tetris that you're playing with your food and And it's all of these numbers that maybe you haven't really paid attention to before. Because when I first started my journey, I only cared about calories. And when it comes to weight loss, weight gain, yes, calories are king. They matter. They're important. But I don't even really think about calories, especially not in the same way that I used to. I used to think I just need to have anything that has a small amount of calories, and that's how I'm going to hit this lower calorie amount. But with macros, I've been able to kind of rewire my brain and not look at it as just, does this have low calories, but really looking at the breakdown of nutrients of food and being able to fuel myself properly without having this lingering thing in the back of my head of, well, that's not 100 calories or that's not under this amount of calories. It's this is what I need to be able to function and I'm going to eat this allotment. So breaking things down into macros allowed me to separate from that calorie mindset that I'd been so stuck in of how many calories burned, how many calories did I eat, how many calories is in this. It's just how can I function and what breakdown of nutrients do I need to do that? Now, of course, macros can be very confusing starting off, but I also feel like one of the most confusing parts of really any industry is when you get into the jargon. The acronyms, (laughs) baby. (laughs) And you know this when you're talking to someone in a different field and they say something so nonchalantly and you're like, what in the world does that mean? (laughs) And they're like, oh, sorry, because it's so normal for them to use those terminology. And I know fitness is exactly the same way. So can you help breaking down some of these letters that are so confusing and if we should even pay attention to them? Absolutely. Um, The first one I'll start with is the acronym TDEE. This stands for Total Daily Energy Expenditure. And this phrase is tossed around. Some people might not have heard of it, but it's important when it comes to evaluating what we need to function best as a body. And I like to talk with my hands, so I may do that a little bit here. (laughs) So... um, Our TDEE, Total Daily Energy Expenditure, um, basically stands for how many calories we burn each day by being human. And there are four ways we do that. So the first way is our BMR, our basal metabolic rate. So a lot of people will say, these are the calories you'd burn if you were in a coma. So the calories we burn blinking and breathing and pumping blood. Then we have our thermic effect of food, or our TEF. And this accounts for the calories we burn when we are digesting and absorbing the nutrients from our food. So we do burn calories while eating. The third category is for non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT. And this accounts for the calories burned when we are moving about our day, but it's not exercise-specific movement. So, you know, fixing our hair, cooking, cleaning, taking the dogs on a walk. That would be neat. And then the fourth category is exercise activity or the calories we burn while we're intentionally exercising. Now, everyone's TDEE or total daily energy expenditure is different and it varies based on your gender, your height, your weight, your age, your physical activity, your lean body mass, so how much muscle you have, your dieting history, etc. 
Now, another concept that's tied really closely to TDEE is the phrase eating at maintenance. So I wanted to explain this as well. So when someone says, you know, I'm eating at maintenance, what they mean is that they're eating the same amount of calories approximately as what they're expending. So essentially their calories in is similar to their calories out. Another way to describe eating at maintenance is energy balance. Now, it's important to note that everyone's maintenance calories are actually a range. It's not one specific number. It's usually a few hundred calories within that range. And it's also so important to understand that your maintenance calories are a moving target because as factors of your TDEE change, your maintenance calorie intake will have to adapt. So for example, if your physical activity increases, your TDEE increases. Whether your NEAT increases or your exercise activity, the amount of calories to sustain your weight is going to increase as well. Or if something decreases, then your maintenance, in, your maintenance intake may decrease. So that's important to understand because I don't think as many people have clarity on that fact. You've made some really great points and brought some things to light that I agree with you not everyone takes into consideration. And not only is it a moving target because things in your life may change, where I've had clients where they've gone to having a more active lifestyle or they're on their feet for their job to having a very sedentary job, Mm -hmm. and then they start to gain weight. And they're like, I haven't changed anything, but they have changed their knee and their expenditure. And so calories might have to come down unless we go ahead and we get in some more movement movement in a different way. Another aspect of that moving target is just that you can change your metabolism. You can change that BMR by gaining more muscle and your body's going to be burning more calories. So for where your maintenance is now, how different is that from where your maintenance was like five years ago? I think about that. That's a great (laughs) question. Yeah. So five years ago, I guess I was tracking calories That would have been 2018, if I'm doing math quickly. So I would have been probably eating around, actually, I think I was eating about 1,500 calories. And at that time, um, I was maybe at maintenance, maybe in a slight deficit. But this was before I had started learning about what I really needed to thrive. I did not feel good. And let's be clear, my health was not good at that point for my body relative to my activity levels. Um, And now I maintain it's rough because I track loosely, um, but probably at about 2,000 to 2,100 calories. Which is incredible. Like most people fight to even get to, or they think, oh, my maintenance is probably around like 1,800 or 1,700. And then they realize, oh, I'm gaining weight at that because their actual maintenance, because of the way that they've been eating and treating their body is much, much lower. Because just like you can have your metabolism and change it in a positive direction, you can change that in a negative direction like you had at that time of because you had consistently eaten so little, your body had adapted to that and that was where your maintenance was. Mm -hmm. And so just to be clear, like I think this is so important. So just to to succinctly summarize, (laughs) in my journey, my maintenance has changed so much because I am more active now in terms of my NEAT and my weight training regimen, but also because I've added a significant amount of muscle (laughs) muscle density. Thank you. Um, And I've worked consistently at that goal. But if you look at photos of me from 2018 till now, I was just like stick thin and didn't, I had some muscle, um, but not at all what I've built. And because of my added muscle tissue, I burn more calories at rest. Muscle is the engine for fat loss. My BMR has gone up. So the combination of BMR going up, NEAT going up, and exercise activity going up has all contributed to my higher maintenance today versus in 2018. I love that because my maintenance is around like a 2200. And that's really awesome to say as a female of, hey, I can be eating 2,200 calories and maintain a weight that I feel relatively comfortable at. To have my maintenance calories be at that 2,200 where before it was at something like a 1,600, a 1,500 because I just was not treating my body the right way and I didn't have the muscle that I have now. And actually, just a small side tangent, Alex and I had a conversation about how much is driven by 
what we like aesthetically and how our lifestyles are within our health. So I care about my health to the core. I didn't always. I cared more about what I looked like Mm -hmm. than what my health was. Mm -hmm. But now I care more about my health. And of course, I love the aesthetic side still. Mm -hmm. And I love that lifting allows my body to look the way that I I want it to. I enjoy that aspect. And within food, one thing that I feel like people don't take into consideration, it's not just the amount of time you exercise, but how hard you're exercising. True. And what we'll see within clients, and I've even seen in myself in time periods where I maybe not be putting as much of an emphasis on training and training intensity, that I do start to gain a little bit of weight because I'm not pushing in the gym the same way. And that always reminds me of, hey, you need to freaking train so that you can eat this because I want to have that higher maintenance. It makes my life so much easier. It makes eating out so much easier and having the flexibility and getting to the point that I just talked about that I don't have a fear when I'm going out Mm -hmm. because if I'm trying to eat 1500 calories, that's freaking hard to do when you're going out and living a normal lifestyle. Can you do it? Yes. Is it as easy at 2200 calories? Absolutely not. Right. It's just all about doing things with intention. Now, when it comes to, I love that you use the term that energy balance and maintenance calories. And so since we did talk about calories being king, what does that look like if I'm trying to purposely gain weight or purposely lose weight? Great question. So when we we talk about maintenance, that's energy balance, where our expenditure is about equivalent to our intake. Now, if we get to a place where our expenditure is higher than our intake, we are going to be in an energy deficit. And so in an energy deficit, you will lose weight. Now, conversely, if you flip that so that your expenditure is lower than your consumption or your calories in are higher than your calories out, that is called an energy surplus. And in an energy surplus, you will gain weight. So it's just important to make that distinction so people understand that generally speaking, if you are in a position where over time the scale is trending up, you are likely in a bit of an energy surplus where calories in are slightly higher than calories out. And conversely, if the scale is trending down, then you are probably in an energy deficit. And within talking about the scale, and you talked about it staying consistent at that maintenance and then increasing or decreasing depending on if you're a surplus or deficit, I think one really important note here is that the scale is not going to stay the exact same number or it's not going to be completely linear regardless of what's happening. You could be at maintenance and maybe you step on the scale one day and the scale says 130 pounds. Then maybe you step on it three or four days later and it says 132 pounds. It doesn't mean that, oh, now I'm definitely in a surplus because my scale weight went up, especially if you're not tracking your scale weight regularly. Because one thing that we do is always looking at averages of what that scale weight is instead of just trying to take these numbers. There's so many things that go on throughout our day and so many so much information we're consuming, different numbers we're consuming. If I step on the scale one day and I see a 134 and then a few days later I see a 138, that can be really hard mentally to be like, oh no, I've, I've gained weight and I'm messing up and I can't believe this is happening when maybe on average I actually ended up still way closer to that 134 Or by even looking at the variables of maybe I went to sleep a little bit late or didn't get a good night of sleep. Maybe I ate my food more in the later part of the day than the beginning part of the day. Maybe I trained really freaking hard like I wanted to and I have some lingering inflammation. Maybe I didn't get in as much water or I didn't move as much that day or my digestion was a little bit off and that caused or it's my menstrual cycle. That caused my scale weight to be off. So I think within scale weight, sometimes it's beneficial to to track your scale weight. Sometimes it's not, just like within macros. It's going to be very individualized for each person. Mm -hmm. And being able to track it, if you are going to track it, and really keep note of it so you're not just trying to juggle all of these numbers and remember what they are, because what gets measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't measuring your scale weight, then you're likely not also measuring all the different metrics that are going into it. And it can be really confusing to see that number change. Yeah, I would honestly recommend if you're listening to this, I would recommend tracking your weight. If you're curious to see how it's trending, I would weigh yourself at the same time each morning after you use the restroom and do that four to seven times throughout the week. And then you'll take that average. So that's your first data point. That's your baseline. And then you have that to 
use and compare in the weeks to follow. So you can do that same thing the second week and look at your average weight that second week relative to the week one. Now that's giving you a little bit more insight. Okay, was my average, you know, 0.25 pounds higher? Was it four pounds higher? What's the discrepancy here? And then do that for a third week and then do that for a fourth week. And that will give you a more earnest picture of, you know, where your average weight is lying. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. So now that we've learned about calories, are all calories the same when I'm eating? Because it's just about calories calories in versus calories out. So it doesn't matter what I'm eating. It just matters how many calories I'm intaking. That is incorrect. (laughs) Dang it. Got that one wrong. Wrong answer. (laughs) Um, All calories are not the same. Um, And so we'll break down the differences in macronutrients and micronutrients and a few other important components that some people might miss um, when they just hear about calories and eating in a surplus versus being in a deficit. So let's talk about macros first. So we have three macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs. Macros have caloric value, meaning our macronutrients are what actually give us the calories and the literal energy to function. So one gram of protein is worth four calories, one gram of carbs is worth four calories, and one gram of fats is worth nine calories. So this is very relevant because as you can see, Eating a source of fat is going to be over two times as caloric as eating a source of carbs or protein. So if you were to have 20 grams of a fat source, that's going to be over two times as calorie dense as 20 grams of a protein or a carb. And this is relevant because at least in America, a lot of people eat more dietary fat than they realize. So therefore, they're consuming more calories perhaps than they realize if they're not tracking. Another thing I think is important to call out is protein specifically. We know that protein is critical for muscle preservation and growth, and we spoke earlier about the importance of maintaining the muscle you have and even growing muscle if that's your goal. But protein also has the biggest role to play in how satiated we feel after eating. So of the three macros, protein will help us feel the most content if we're getting an adequate amount with our meals. And if you want to learn more about protein, we do have a YouTube video that we will also link down below, which is going to give you the full lowdown on protein, different protein options, and even more on why it's important, although Courtney definitely just summarized it extremely nicely. And one thing I like to point out within fat is just because it's more calories doesn't mean that it's bad. Right. And fat is actually needed for normal hormone regulation, which of course we want, because a healthy body is going to respond bond without drastic measures. And being able to have in enough fat, we don't want to just bottom that and say, oh, I should never eat anything that has fat in it because that's going to be way more calories. Fat is good for you and it is going to help your body, but it's just looking at the total combination. So when we talk about anything within nutrition, we're not ever talking in extremes or in absolutes. We are talking about context and how it applies to your life. So while it is a fact that protein protein, one gram of protein is four calories. It's not saying because it's less calories, it is what you should just gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. It's about having a balance between all three of these macros. And I know that different times in my life have called me to have higher or lower fat or higher or lower carbs, regardless of if I'm trying to be in a deficit, just even at maintenance, kind of those amounts moving around and being able to suit what my lifestyle is or what my goals are. And it's just extremely important to recognize all of these macronutrients are important and it's figuring out what distribution of them is going to work best for you and what your goals are. Because when we're looking at anything within context, we have to apply it to what our exact goals are. Otherwise, you just end up being very aimless of, okay, what should this be at? Uh, I don't have an answer because I don't know what your goal is within what you're trying to achieve. Exactly. I was just going to say, that's why we don't want to just blindly copy somebody's macros or somebody's caloric intake. And you make such a great point. And um, what I also was going to say is, If you're just starting off and trying to learn more about nutrition and how to really nourish your body, one of the first tips I recommend is 
becoming more familiar with where the calories of the foods you're eating are coming from. So take some food that you like to eat frequently, say an apple. (laughs) It's going to be important to understand where the majority of those calories are coming from. And what I mean is, is this apple a carb, a fat, a protein, or some combination? Because all foods are some combination or primarily one of the three macros. So for the case of the apple, that's primarily a carb source. And so you need to understand where the calories from the foods are coming from, what macronutrient or nutrients comprise that food. But also we then want to build meals that are a combination of proteins, fats, and carbs. Because getting all three nutrients is going to help us feel very satiated after eating and it's gonna help minimize cravings. Another thing that I give advice for if someone's just starting and they're wanting to track macros is to not give themselves macros to hit. Right. Just track what you eat for a week, not only to familiarize yourself with a tracking app and getting in the habit of doing it, because the habit of tracking your food is also difficult to start off. Get yourself in the habit and see where your intake is because you can't change if you, again, don't know the baseline. You don't have that data to make a decision. So being able to get into the habit of tracking, not trying to eat differently, just tracking your foods and using that to kind of audit yourself and learn through the process of, oh, uh, today I felt really good. Let's take a look at my food. I ended up eating about 130 grams of protein and I had 200 grams of carbs carbs and I had 50 grams of fat, I had a really solid day. Then maybe the next day you're thinking, I feel really tired. I feel worn down. And you look and it's, oh, I only got 30 grams of protein and I got 70 grams of fats and 90 grams of carbs. Maybe I do need to eat a little bit more today and bias it towards protein so that I feel a little bit better. So you can use this of not, I have to know everything about macros and I have to know what macros I need to hit. You can truly use yourself as your own example, get into the habit. And once you have solidified what your intake is and how you feel, then you can make small changes from there. Exactly. And what I'll also say is, if you're trying to get started and you're doing this initial audit on yourself while eating normally and just collecting data and starting to build this skill and build this awareness, there are a couple of things you can keep in mind. So if you have goals of improving your health and your body composition, the general recommendation when looking at how your calories are distributed amongst the three macros is you'd love to have 25 to 30% of your calories coming from protein, 40 to 50% of your calories coming from carbs, and about 20 to 30% of your calories coming from fats. So do I only need to focus on hitting my macros when I'm trying to hit something? Because then I could just have ice cream and then maybe like a protein shake, and that would hit what my needs are for the meal. Or is there something else that I need to focus on? There's a little something else. You got that one correct. (laughs) So micronutrients are um, what I like to call the invisible superheroes of our health. (laughs) When I say micronutrients, I'm talking about vitamins and minerals. These guys do not have caloric value. So they don't literally give us energy the way that proteins, fats, and carbs do. But vitamins and minerals are what fuel the cellular processes in our body. They are literally what keep our body functioning at a cellular systematic level. And they are the foundation for our energy, our sleep, our metabolism, our muscle oxygenation, our immune health, our bone health, our cognitive health, our immune system strength, if I didn't already say that. (laughs) A lot of things that are really important. (laughs) Yes. And um, everyone, obviously, is aiming for that level of health. Again, that's how you're going to feel your best. Regardless of what you want your body to look on the outside, you need to have a system that's humming on the inside to ever achieve different body comp external goals. And it's going to make you feel better. It's going to immediately increase quality of life. You also have to be especially cognizant of your micronutrient intake if you are someone who is a vegan or a vegetarian, if you are uh, someone who has a menstrual cycle, if you are someone who has been on hormonal birth control, either in the past or currently, because hormonal birth control can deplete us of key vitamins and minerals. It's important if you have suboptimal thyroid function because the thyroid is a nutrient-dependent gland, so if you have hyper or hypothyroidism. If you have a digestive condition, so maybe you have Crohn's, maybe you have IBS or IBD, 
If you have a history of under eating or being chronically stressed, you could be depleted of certain vitamins and minerals, or if you're in some sort of strategic food elimination protocol. And while these things don't give us specific energy like macronutrients do, like you said, they're fueling the cellular process, so they do definitely contribute to what your energy is. So just a quick example, if someone has very low vitamin D levels, they can feel very lethargic. They can actually have like their bones start to break down because they're not getting what they need, and that's going to obviously make you feel weaker, and you can just feel even more depressed, and your mood can be very downregulated by just that one vitamin. And you can also take a look at your electrolytes of, again, that's something where you can feel very lethargic. You can have the fluid balance off in your body because of these minerals and vitamins that really are those superheroes that allow us to do what we need to. They're essential for the body to function. And I love that you made that note of how you feel because I think exactly what I talked about earlier, a lot of times we focus on how we look, which valid. I still focus on how I look, but I also want to feel and function at my highest capacity and making sure that I get in a variety of nutrients really allows me to do that. Exactly. Because when you're functioning best or at your highest capacity, I love the way you said that, you're going to show up better in every single element of your life. You're going to be able to feel more like yourself. Like for me, when I'm energized, when I've slept well, when I'm humming like a well-oiled machine, I'm more zesty. (laughs) That's my favorite adjective recently. (laughs) All my clients hear me say it on my (laughs) check-ins. But truly, I feel more alive, a little more invigorated. And um, that allows me to work more vibrantly. That allows me to be more engaged when I'm with my husband, with my family, with my friends. And that's what we want at the end of the day. And I think you hit on something perfectly by saying we don't want a deficiency. So then the question is, well, how do I avoid a deficiency? And the answer is kind of simple. It's eat enough. And eat nutrient-dense foods, which is another phrase, back to our earlier conversation, that I think, I mean, I say a lot, and I think it's popular on social media nowadays. So what do I mean when I say nutrient-dense foods? Pretty much, I just mean that relative to the amount of calories in a food or per bite, you're getting a good amount of vitamins and minerals. And typically, foods that are minimally processed are more nutrient-dense. So, you know, less processed animal products and plant products. And these are the foods that have the most vitamins and minerals, so they're probably going to make us feel the most content, the most energized. Um, And that's why coaches and other health professionals often will talk about striking a balance of getting 80 or so percent of what you eat from minimally processed, nutrient-dense foods because we know how much of an impact they make in how we feel. But at the same time, you don't have to exclusively eat clean foods or all unprocessed foods because that fosters an unhealthy relationship with food. It can foster an unhealthy relationship with your body, and it's not necessary to maintain optimal health and function at your highest capacity. And so it's so important for us at PD to talk about food in a very inclusive way. And, you know, that balance, that 80-20 balance is great to strike. Some days you might have a 90-10 day and some days you might have a 50-50 day and that's okay. We just want to understand the foods that make us feel our best and make sure we're prioritizing them when we can to feel more satisfied and to have good energy. I always like to look at food on a spectrum instead of labeling it as good or bad or healthy or not healthy food, of recognizing there's foods that are going to be more nutrient-dense and foods that are going to be less nutrient-dense, and then there's going to be foods that are going to be more calorically dense and less calorically dense. And you can have a food that is nutrient-dense and calorically dense. Mm -hmm. You can have a food that is nutrient-dense and less Uh, calorically dense. Mm -hmm. You can have something that is, again, the opposite of that too. And so being able to really look at it of we're on a spectrum, on a sliding scale. It's not just this is bad, this is good. It's all foods can fit. It's just figuring out how they fit to allow us to live our best. Because I used to be an IIFYMer, which if it fits your macros, it's going in. That was like <laughs> 2018, 2017. Yes, 2017. Yes. <laughs> there is a full day of eating, and maybe I need to go back and recreate it now. <laughs> That'd be There's fun. one on my old YouTube channel, <laughs> and I I like I think the cover is me holding cookie crisp and I think for that meal I have like ice cream and cookie crisp because I was really passionate about showing people that 
health and losing weight didn't have to be boring, but I went so far in the opposite direction. Uh, and I think it was a, a meaningful thing to talk about because, like I just said, all foods fit and to show that balance. And that is one of my favorite things when I go out in public and I go out and I'm around people, they see me eating something that they've maybe categorized as bad or, or unhealthy, off limits. off limits. And they think, Sue, you're a fitness coach. How can you eat that? Or like, are you allowed to day. eat it? Are, like, yeah, is this your cheat day? Are you allowed to eat this? And I'm like, yeah, I can eat whatever I want. And that truly is at the core of it. But it's so fun because now I do eat whatever I want, but it's so much more biased towards whole and minimally processed foods. But of course, I'm still getting an ice cream when I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. If we restrict foods unnecessarily, again, it doesn't foster a healthy relationship with food, and it can lead to us eventually overindulging on foods that we arbitrarily put off limits whenever they do cross our path. So ultimately, having this inclusive mindset around food is a win, win, win. Now, fiber is something that I feel like is talked about and advertised a ton, but still honestly pretty misunderstood. You see it on cereals and just on food of high fiber or this many net carbs. So what does it, what, what really do I need to know about fiber? And should I just try to get as much as I can because fiber is good for me? No. <laughs> wow, I'm really missing the mark on <laughs> okay. these. You're uh, one for three. <laughs> Um, getting as much fiber as you can would probably be a little problematic, just like not eating enough fiber would be a little problematic. And I do agree. I think it's a little confusing to people. So we'll just try and simplify it here. Um, eating an appropriate amount of fiber plays an enormous role in our health. And I cannot tell you, I like love talking about fiber with my clients <laughs> because it kind of feels like this little hidden gem that people don't pay attention to um, or quite understand. And as soon as we narrow in on that guy and like refine it over a few weeks, great things start to happen. It is so cool. It feels like magic. I'm like, it's this little secret lever that we pull. Um, and so for those who don't know, fiber does not come from animal products or animal foods. It is the indigestible portion of plant foods. So we're talking fruits, vegetables, some whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes. Fiber improves our digestive health, which I think people know at a high level because it speeds up our gut motility. It keeps things moving. It can help prevent constipation, diarrhea, other discomfort digestion-wise. It just promotes healthy bowel movements. It also helps lower LDL. It can help prevent colon cancer. It can help with fat loss by promoting satiety. So essentially, foods that are a bit higher in fiber are going to be a little bit more satiating and keep us feeling um, more content and help with regulating our appetite. And fiber can also prevent spikes in blood sugar that can lead to increased hunger. Now, if you're tracking macros or you're doing a little audit for yourself, the recommendation is to have about 14 grams of fiber per 1,000 calories you consume. So if you're consuming 2,000 calories a day, that would be about 28 grams of fiber. Everyone's threshold is a little bit different, but starting with that gauge is going to be extremely helpful. I agree. I normally go within that 10 to 14 grams just to be able to give people a range mm -hmm. of what that looks like because it does vary person to person. If I have some clients that can handle a high amount of fiber, like 50 grams of fiber, whereas for me, really my threshold is right around that 25, like 30 is pushing it. Mm. And so being able to find that and recognize it changes with your calories, which a lot of people don't recognize because they'll just eat a lot of the same or when they're dieting, they'll add in more fiber foods because because it is more voluminous, it does help with your satiety. And then they'll find themselves in a place where they're super constipated or they feel bloated and they're eating great foods and making great choices. But just because they're eating less, then that's also going to contribute to how much fiber they should have in play. Exactly. And a couple other things that I'll say about fiber is if you are unsure of where to start, but you think you want to be increasing your fiber intake. Maybe you do track for a week and you realize some days you're in the single digits. I'm telling you right now that increasing your fiber is going to do wonders for your digestive health, for your appetite regulation, for your energy as well. It is a game changer. I'm team fiber forever. <laughs> um, but going from eight grams of fiber a day to 20 is going to be 
uncomfortable um, if, if you do that overnight. And so my recommendation would be to do an, a gradual increase of fiber. And a nice way to do this for yourself is if you're having one fibrous piece of food per day or serving of food, maybe go to two or three servings per day. So maybe try to have a fruit or a vegetable with each meal. If you're only having like one piece of fruit or one veggie per day, do a slight increase. Give your body about a week with that change because your gut will adapt to the increases in fiber up to a point. Um, But making a really dramatic increase like over five grams or something overnight give or take, is going to feel a little less comfortable. You may experience some gas, some distension, some bloating. And so if we can minimize that, um, we'd love to. Yeah. And also making sure this fiber is spread out throughout the day. So you're not just having one protein bar that has 20 grams of fiber in it, being like, got my fiber for the day, don't need to have any fruits or veggies, where definitely would not recommend probably having a ton more fruits and veggies on top of that 20 grams of fiber, but being able to have that spread so that you do have that digestive comfort throughout the day because no one likes feeling bloated and uncomfortable. Correct. (laughs) If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. So I know we touched on it of there's not necessarily bad foods, but you did talk on processed foods. So what's the lowdown on processed foods and why we should possibly eat them a little bit less? So I think this is important to understand. And again, we're getting to like the why behind some of these recommendations. And this was something that at first, and honestly, up until more recently, I didn't completely understand. I'll also say this is a very simplified explanation, what I'm about to share, but it will help. I think it will resonate with people. And the important thing to know here is this applies, this science applies to every single person on the planet. (laughs) So no matter how motivated or disciplined you are, your body's going to react this way when eating something that is, you know, what some may refer to as ultra processed or unhealthy. And when I say ultra processed or unhealthy, to use definitions in recent scientific literature, that basically is explaining or referencing foods that do not have much nutrient density. There are not many vitamins and minerals relative to the amount of calories in that food. Or when we're talking about ultra processed foods, they're things that you can't necessarily find in nature. They don't look like things in nature. They've maybe had some added emulsifiers or um, preservatives, colorings, sweeteners, flavors, et cetera. So that is just the way that those things are defined nowadays. And it's important to understand that. But again, we are not against eating these foods. It's just helpful to know what they do at a scientific level in our bodies. So these foods are designed in factories or created in factories, um, but they're made to be highly palatable. So they're made to be really freaking tasty and they're made to keep you coming back for more. And so when we eat something that's designed that way, what happens is our reward system in our brain starts triggering a little bit on overdrive and we release dopamine and serotonin and it gives us that good feeling and we want more. Now, typically foods that are a little more processed, um, are a little more calorie dense, which is a phrase used earlier, meaning like per bite, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck in terms of the amount of calories consumed. So if we're eating these foods that are more calorie dense, we're getting a lot of energy from food pretty quickly at the same time that our reward systems are buzzing. And so what that leads to is our digestive system cannot keep up with or respond um, or overpower the reward system. So basically, we cannot signal to our brain, hey, we've consumed enough energy now, like we have satisfied the hunger that was here quickly enough. And so that leads to consuming more food to actually reach that level of satisfaction than it would if we were eating foods that were a little bit less processed. I know that when before I really got into fitness, I used to think people were lying about quote, healthy food tasting good, I thought they had literally just lied to themselves because I grew up <laughs> eating. I I was I thought that they were delusional because I did not think that you could make 
quote, healthy food tastes good. I mean, you're not, I know so many people who still think that way. Yes. And I grew up eating a lot of ultra processed food of Little Debbie's and still alive and well in my parents' house. And I'm pro Little Debbie. Let me just state that before you think I'm demonizing them. But we had fast food, we had processed food, and I just was so used to that palate that it took my palate a little bit of time to change to when I started eating less processed foods. But your taste buds are really interesting that they can change and shift, and you actually end up putting yourself in a better place as far as those signals by being able to go through that transition. It takes time, and it's not all at once, but being able to recognize that your taste buds can change, and you might even feel like that addictive pull towards some of that food. And I know that that word, people sometimes get upset using that word when it comes to food, but exactly what you said, they're made to be highly palatable and addictive to keep you coming back. Because at the end of the day, these companies are a business. They want to be able to have your business and have your money. And the way that they do that is keep coming back for more. And it's designed specifically that way to have that response, to not get the satiety, then to go back again and again and again. And that's also how food gives us comfort sometimes, Mm -hmm. is we lean into that feeling that feel good. And we're just like, I just want to eat to have that feel good. And that's valid. Sometimes you do need to eat a little bit for comfort. For the soul. Yes, for for the the soul. soul. (laughs) And sometimes you just need to go and have some food that is highly palatable, and that's completely fine. But when we talk about anything, just like fiber, fiber's good, but we're not trying to just have as much as possible because it's good for us. Same thing with any of this. Just because something's good doesn't mean we need to have it at exorbitant amounts. And just because it's bad, quote bad, doesn't mean that we never are supposed to have it. It's all about pulling those levers for being able to have something in moderation or fitting in that 80-20 that you talked about. And I think the best way to go about this is, so two things. When we want something, because it, you know, it's one of our favorite foods. First of all, if we're going to have something, no matter if it's, you know, more nutrient dense, less nutrient dense, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure we're eating foods that we do really enjoy. Um, and granted, there may be some experimenting to figure out how to cook things and make them like tasty or um, satisfying to us. But if you're going to choose any food, make sure it's something you're like truly excited about eating. We want to eat what we like. We want to find ways to add nutrients and strike a good balance, but in ways that we're excited about our meals where we actually find them really tasty. And that's um, more possible than I think some people initially think when it comes to incorporating um, more nutrient-dense foods. But at the same time, say there is something that is a little more processed or um, a little less nutrient-dense that we want to enjoy and we're stoked like I love my flaming Hot Cheetos. Not me, unfortunately. <laughs> I always wanted to like those, but never could. No, yeah, I have FOMO a little bit about it. <laughs> yeah. So um, say you're like, I'm eating my flaming Hot Cheetos. I love them for lunch, Courtney. I'm not giving them up. That's fine. No one said you have to. Um, they're delicious, and they maybe are nostalgic for you. Like that's in, enhancing that experience. But because we know that they're not going to leave you feeling super satisfied by themselves, why don't we add something to that snack or that meal that maybe has a little bit of higher nutrient density or higher fiber just so that it's going to leave you feeling more satisfied and give you better, more sustained energy? I love using this tip with clients too, because when you look at it the opposite way, if I need to take this away, then you're restricting, you're removing something, and that can be really hard mentally, because a lot of what we're talking about within nutrition is also driven between your ears. And when we look at that, if it's, no, someone's taking that away from me, now I feel like I don't want to do this anymore. We can add to it instead of taking away. And I do this every single day, tortilla chips are my ride or die. I love them to my soul. I will bottom them if they're at a table. I love tortilla chips. And instead of saying, oh, I can't have tortilla chips because it's really just carbs and fats and it's not adding to my meals, I actually eat them with my meals and use it kind of like Chipotle of eating my rice bowls with it. So every day I have a rice and turkey and spinach meal and I use the tortilla chips to eat it. And I also will use it if I have like a beef and rice meal or if I have a chicken and rice meal, like I will use tortilla chips all throughout my day and I go through bags and bags of tortilla chips while still hitting my goals within my physique and my performance goals. And 
People will say, how do you eat tortilla chips? Or how do you do this with being able to maintain that? And, and it's Sue all, says, how do you not eat tortilla How do you chips? not go and eat tortilla chips? I don't get it. <laughs> how are they not just calling to you at all times? And it has allowed me to also have such a better relationship with tortilla chips instead of thinking, I can't have them in my house because I'll just bottom the whole bag. I weigh them out. I measure them. I take them to the table. I'm not just leaving an open bag on the table because that will end poorly, (laughs) let me tell you. I know that about myself, so I do not put myself in that position. I weigh it out. I eat them. Some I eat like just by themselves, and others I do eat like within the rice, and I'm able to enjoy them. And now when I see tortilla chips, because I get them so regularly, I don't feel like I have to go all out and bottom them Mm -hmm. because I haven't restricted myself from them. I've put them in my daily life. And that's just one small example of taking something you love and still making it a part of what you do. And with Courtney talking about like finding food that works, finding how to cook it, I cannot emphasize that enough. It took me time to find the foods that I like, to find the vegetables that I liked and how to implement them into my life. And so I could just, if I could say anything to you, it's don't give up on this food until you've tried it different ways and being able to like reimagine how these foods can be in your life and not think that food has to be boring if it's going to be good for you. Because trust my food is not this epitome of boring. It's fun. It's enjoyable. I like it. I look forward to it. It did take some time to get there, but it's well worth it. Yeah. Experimentation is everything. Like you're building a skill when you're learning how to prepare food. So think back to when you were like playing sports as a child or learning an instrument or doing something for the first time. It's going to be clunky for the first many reps or practices. The same thing goes with preparing broccoli (laughs) or something. Mm -hmm. You know, pick any food. The first time preparing it, it's going to be fine. Maybe, maybe it's trash. That doesn't mean that you need to write that food off. There's probably so many ways you can prepare it. So if you're working with a coach, ask them. They've probably figured it out. Or go online or type in TikTok or go to Instagram and like look for quick recipes and easy ways to prep foods and just go into the kitchen with this experimental mindset and keep it light for yourself. Literally go in with like, I'll tell clients to just get like, say they want to try eating sweet potatoes, buy one, buy one sweet potato Pick one way to make it that you think sounds good and try it. Don't build your whole week of eating around yes. a sweet potato. <laughs> Go in, have a little fun, maybe like have a glass of wine, cook your potato, see how it goes. If it turns out phenomenal, excellent. If it turns out okay, what can you maybe try next time? If you think it's just not for you, okay, that's great. You've learned something new and you're getting yourself closer to what does work for you. So like yesterday we talked about failure. Failure is good in the kitchen too because it helps you figure out, well, that doesn't work, so now I need to try something new. And I used to hate carrots. My entire life, I was anti-carrot until I found out how great they are when they're air fried Mm. because I hate that mushy carrot, like the kind that's in like a roast. I know some people love it, but it is not for me at all. And I felt like I had always just been served. I don't like raw carrots. I do not like the mushy carrots. But then I started to make carrot fries and preparing them similar. (laughs) Yes, preparing them similar to how I prepared sweet potatoes. Mm. And I love carrots. And now I say it's one of my favorite vegetables with the little asterisk of I'm not eating them roasted. Prepared uh, by me. Yeah, prepared by myself. (laughs) Um, I don't want them mushy. I I will eat them roasted, but have some crisp on it. Being able to be cooked all the way through, it builds such like flavor within the carrot. And it's so good. And it took me 20 three years to figure out that I liked carrots just because I had to get past the mindset, I don't like carrots and just try a different way. Totally. Now you hear the phrase a lot, you are what you eat. And I often like to rephrase that to you are what you digest. But I think another way that we can phrase it is you are how you eat. Do you agree with this? Completely. And I talk to my clients about this a lot. How you eat has a huge role, arguably just as big of a role on your health as what you're eating. Because if we are not um, digesting and absorbing the nutrients from our food appropriately, like That's the point of eating. The point of eating, yes, we do get satisfaction, like mentally, emotionally. There is that comfort, um, that joy. But ultimately, we're trying to fuel our system. And so 
swallowing the food does not fuel our system. <laughs> Absorbing the nutrients does. And so you've got some wonderful content out there already. There's the Digestion Tears YouTube video and the Digestion Starter Pack series, episodes one and two on the podcast. So if you haven't listened to those, you absolutely should. Um, but I'll just touch on a couple of my favorite components um, that relate to like our meal hygiene that can help you set your body up for success with absorbing the nutrients from your food. So the first thing I like to say is create space for your meals. Yes. So this means a few things to me. Number one, you have to carve out time where you plan to eat each day. And ideally, we're eating at a consistent time throughout the day, day after day. So a consistent number of meals each day as well as around consistent time. So for example, if you feel like with your appetite and your hunger signaling and your schedule, you can eat breakfast around eight or nine each day, then let's try that and be consistent there. And then you know maybe 1 p.m. is a great sweet spot for lunch. Then try to be consistent between maybe 12 and 2 hitting lunch, similar for dinner and similar for snacks. So not having a plan is going to leave it up to future you who might be a little frazzled with everything that's going on that day to try and figure out what to eat, when to eat, how to eat. That's not going to ultimately help you be resting and in a place to appropriately digest. So creating some consistency there is going to help the body thrive. The body loves that consistency of knowing we're going to get energy. When we signal, hey, to the brain, I'm hungry. Within an hour or so, we're going to get some food. So that's important. And then I also think it's important to make sure our heart rate has come down so I know personally that if I have had just like an elevated, like stimulated few hours, whether it's work or I'm running around, and if I go and just start eating right away, I will be gurgling and bubbling mm -hmm. and uncomfortable. The same meal that sits completely fine normally, exactly. but now it is causing ruckus. And I'll, my husband knows now. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I should have just come down a little bit more because- We say it all the time. It lingers too, the, mm -hmm. the pain. It's not true pain. It's just discomfort, and I'm aware of it, and then I'm distracted by it. Mm -hmm. And so one tip I like to give clients is to do a little box breathing before you eat, which literally only takes, like it could be as short as two minutes. If you can give it five, spectacular. But we want to box breathe. So we're breathing from our diaphragm and we want to inhale for four beats, hold for four beats, exhale for four beats, hold for four beats. That's one cycle. Do five or 10 cycles. And I'm telling you, it will, in a matter of moments, physiologically bring you mm -hmm. into this place, you'll feel a difference. Oh, I don't, yes. I feel like a tingling mm -hmm. <laughs> occur. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my body's coming down from this fight or flight state. It's really wonderful. And you'll be able to just be in like this different piece <laughs> as you begin eating a meal. And that's how you want to be to properly digest and absorb. And if you can carve out 15, 20 minutes to just sit and eat. Maybe you watch a little show. Maybe you chat with a colleague or a significant other. We want to try not to be working. And I know it's not always perfect, but when you can, even at, if at the very least it's on the days you're not working, you can do this for your lunch and your dinner. Give it a try. I mean, carving out the time has been huge for me this past year because it always seemed like I'm always going to eat, so I don't really need to put it in my schedule. And now I time block it in my schedule Same. if I'm going to be eating during this time. And I give myself a bigger pocket than like e it takes to eat the meal just so I'm not in a place where I end up rushing because I used to give myself like a 15-minute time block on my calendar. But that would also be me like heating it up, getting the meal together, sitting down and eating it. So I was eating the meal in like five minutes and or I would eat it in the appropriate time and I would feel like I was getting behind on my day which just because shoots yeah, up anxiety so my anxiety would go up I wouldn't want to stop to eat and I would get in a really weird cycle where now I normally budget an hour so then it gives me time and I know that's not realistic for absolutely everyone I'm just talking on myself but I'll give myself an hour so that gives me time to make mine and Alex's meals since we do like to time up for us eating together we're able to sit down eat and then possibly go for a short walk after. A lot of times I'll finish in maybe that 30 minutes. And then I'm like, oh, I got 30 minutes back in my day that I can maybe go on that walk, maybe just sit here and talk for a little bit to take a break. Or maybe I get to do something that I didn't think that I had time for. But I'd much rather budget too much time and get time back mm -hmm. than not enough and feel behind the whole day and rushed. And there are so many times that we will sit there, we'll finish a meal. And we said, we ate that way too fast. 
Like I should have stopped and we're much better at stopping now, but it took all the discomfort time and time again to remind me I need to freaking slow down when I'm eating this meal and chew it thoroughly. And I want to jump in and say something because, yeah, I'm sure that people will hear you say, oh, I take an hour and be like, okay, well, LOL, that's not possible. But here's something that I think some people may know if they follow you guys for a while, but maybe if they're not or you're new here, you guys have such a specific agenda and you wake up at the butt crack of dawn (laughs) and you do that for a reason. There is a method to the madness. And for the first two, three, four hours of your day, when most people are still sleeping or, you know, some people get up, but you are working and you are spending so much dedicated time without distraction cranking so that because you know how much of a priority it is for you Mm -hmm. to be able to spend time just eating without feeling rushed because you know how that affects your anxiety. You also know you want to get movement in through your day. And so it makes sense to do it after a meal to help your digestion. So after years, years Mm -hmm. of practice, not only as an individual, but then also after being married, and I know what that feels like to have to adjust and find what routines work for the two of you together, um, you've realized I would rather wake up early, crank out some work, and get so much done by the time I want to have my hour-long lunch. It's not only a brain break from work. I'm preparing food for myself and in my situation, you know, your spouse, and I'm getting some movement in. It's kind of like three in one. Oh, yeah. And you're also eliminating the anxiety and the discomfort that would come from otherwise being rushed. And again, yes, for sure, you have extra flexibility because we work from home. That is what some people do not have. I'm not blind to that. I lived that life for five years. Like I get it. But at the same time, what you did, which some people just hit a barrier with, is you pulled back at such a macro level to be like, I have my day. What am I willing to do? Am I willing to go to bed a little earlier so that I can get up a little earlier so that I can do so much and then be able to carve out this little precious hour of time middle of the day, whereas some people might be sleeping longer or staying up later at night. So that time is still used just in a different component. And you're prioritizing digestion and mealtime, whereas maybe someone else is prioritizing like a few hours of winding down or Netflix at night or, you know, sleeping in a little bit later because they've stayed up later or something like that. Uh, I mean, just 100%. And it's taken, like you said, years of trial and error, figuring it out. And I find that I work best in the morning. I like waking up early and I like getting that work done before other people are awake, before my inbox gets flooded or I start getting alerts or messages. I love that time. That took time for me to figure out I love that time. And then we found out we want to be really intentional since we did get up and work to have a break for ourselves of we as human beings can't just work 24-7 with no breaks. There's so much research to state of taking regular breaks actually increases your productivity and focus. So being able to have that time and with Alex and I, we have to wear hats for each other. If he's my coach and then he's also my business partner and then he's also my husband and we can get stuck in those different hats because we're working a lot throughout the day that it's really nice of, hey, let's have this little bit of intentional time to just be here and talk as husband and wife. And we normally plan for our breakfast and lunch for us to eat those together. Not every day does that work out perfectly, but we try to be intentional about that. And then normally my third meal is a grab and go where I'm at my desk and I choose something like a bar or a shake or a smoothie that can be digested easier at my desk where, yeah, we just gave the advice, don't eat at your desk. And then I'm sitting here telling you I eat at my desk because these are going to be suggestions and guidelines to build out again what works for you. And for me, that third meal is really hard to sit down and eat because I am trying to finish my work so I can cut it off so I can get to bed. I can have wind down time. I can do what I want to do. And that means having a meal that's a little bit more grab and go. But I choose something that's going to digest easier so that because I am eating it at my desk, I'm not eating distracted, eating super quickly, and then having those stomach aches. I'm choosing something that is way easier easier to digest. I'm intentional about still sipping it slow 
and being able to have that productivity for my day and maintain those nutrients and that energy from the food instead of it causing that massive discomfort. Because there's nothing worse (laughs) than needing the energy from the food and then absolutely just porking yourself by how you ate the food Mm -hmm. and how you set yourself up that now you feel worse. And then you're like, I don't even want to eat because that was an awful experience. And it could impact digestion and bowel movements, and that could last a day, half a day, whatever. So yeah, there is a compounding effect. And I think you kind of alluded to a couple of the other things I wanted to hit on in terms of just how we eat, our meal hygiene. So eating slowly, like you said, um, we don't want to be scarfing our food down. Ideally, we're seated instead of standing. Um, We want to be chewing our food thoroughly. And what can really help with that is if it's a meal that involves utensils, setting those down or chips, (laughs) setting those down. (laughs) Okay. I don't know about that. (laughs) (laughs) Setting them down between bites just so you can really make sure you're chewing and swallowing thoroughly before, um, you know, eating too quickly by accident. We also want to be aware of our water intake. So it's important not to be chugging water right before, during, or right after a meal. We want to make sure we're taking small sips in that window of time because we don't want to disrupt our stomach acid and the food that we are consuming. And then the last thing is, like Sue said, um, if you feel like your meal hygiene is in a good spot, meaning you're not eating too quickly, um, you've eaten foods that generally digest well for you. If you start feeling kind of funky, take note of that and take note of what was in that meal, the ingredients, because it's possible that there was a specific ingredient that you have a sensitivity to. And if you think all of the other boxes are checked and you're still feeling a little wonky, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, you know, the next morning after eating a food, um, collecting that data might help you recognize a pattern. So that's where we're not focused on like the specific foods or or the specific food quantities. Like with my fitness pal, we're focused on the foods themselves. So that's more of like a food journal, but that's a practice you can absolutely implement as well. Great. And now before we close this out, we know this was a lot of information, but I think it was very pertinent and helpful information. And I think that this is a podcast that you could listen to again and still get something really positive out of it. Because one great thing that Alex actually always reminds me, because I get caught up in trying to download all the information that's being given to me and try to remember all of it because I want to make it worth my time. I want to make sure I got out of it is just trying to take one thing. And that's helped me so much. Of if I can take and apply one thing from this, then it was worth my time. And so what are some of those maybe one things that someone could take from this? But of course, they could re-listen and grab a few others. Yeah. So the first one is remember that improving your nutrition is not about restriction. It's about abundance. It's about making sure you're eating enough of the right nutrients to support your energy, to feel content after eating, and to support your overall health. Another one is... As you start refining meals to make them more balanced, if you start making changes, make a menu for yourself. I tell this to my clients. It's one of my favorite tips that I've been sharing more recently, but I realized it's what I did at first as well. If you make a meal and it's balanced, there are great micronutrients, there are great macronutrients, it digests well for you, it was tasty, you would love to eat that again at some point in your life, write that down whether it's on your phone or you're a pen and paper kind of person, write it down and consistently add to this list. It doesn't take much time. And after a couple of weeks, if you front load by creating this little menu for yourself, it saves future you so so much much effort. Because then you're like, hmm, I wonder what I want to grocery shop for. What are the meals I want to cook? Or like, hmm, what should I make with the foods that I have? Just pull up your little menu and take a quick look at what's in the fridge, what you want to buy from the store. It makes... It's a huge time saver Mm -hmm. and um, it makes life easier. (laughs) So again, we're all coming back to wanting to really enjoy these meals and this is a way to do that. Also along a similar vein, when you go grocery shopping, think of yourself as the guardian angel of future you. Remember, future you is, we can assume, maybe running around, you know, trying to balance all of the hats, keep all the cylinders spinning in real time. Maybe you're a little hungry. Maybe you're a little stressed. Maybe you're super happy and um, there's just a lot going on. But if you have been that guardian angel and gotten the food that you know you'll need, at least in the fridge and in the pantry, it'll set you up for success for that day or that week so that hungry you or stressed you isn't floundering. And the last two, which are probably my favorite, when you're trying to make improvements 
Start so small, pick the low-hanging fruit, and make the barrier to entry so easy for yourself. So for example, say you're someone who wants to try and eat meals at home a little more frequently. Maybe you usually buy food out for most of your meals and you're trying to make a change. Don't go from eating three meals out to eating all of your meals at home and making yourself cook all of them. Pick one meal and find a couple meals for lunch, for example, that only take 10 or 15 minutes to prep. And then practice that. And once you get really comfortable and maybe you've made a little menu of like three amazing lunches that you love, pick another small thing and move forward with that. And then lastly, as you practice or implement new things, don't judge or shame yourself. If you make a plan and you try something and it doesn't go perfectly, don't dwell on that and don't feel negatively about yourself or your effort. That happens. There is going to be trial and a little bit of error. But remember, the error is helpful. And I just want you to learn from what your body is telling you in that situation and use that new knowledge as you're making food decisions moving forward. And I think failure is important to talk about here of that error part because you you are going to fail. You are going to have things that you mess up on or you don't make a good meal or you make the wrong decision. And that is all a part of learning. And it's so important to turn your L's into lessons. I learned this the hard way from having so many L's and not turning them to lessons where you can grow from each of those experiences. Maybe you make a meal that you hate hey, I found out that's a meal I don't want to make anymore. It's something you can always improve from. And I actually saw something on Instagram the other day, and it said, here's a reminder to yourself that when you have those days where you're burnt, you're burnt out and you're mean to someone or you're mean to someone you love or you're sad and so withdrawn that you hurt someone's feelings or maybe you messed up and you're embarrassed or you took something too far and you're ashamed this is a reminder that you still deserve to forgive yourself you still owe it to yourself to show up and take care of yourself you always have the power to make your hard days shape you into someone you are proud of remember that And it's so easy to get down on yourself when you're trying to change something in your life or you're in a place of maybe you're a perfectionist, if you've also listened to that podcast too, and you don't want to suck at something and you don't want to try something and look like you don't know what you're talking about to circle back to the questions of, I don't want to ask a question because I'm going to look stupid. You deserve to allow yourself grace and to move forward and to grow from that because when it comes to growth, Of course, you know the phrase, it happens outside of your comfort zone, but growth requires a whole hell of a lot of grace to truly be able to grow. Just like I said, scale weight's not linear, growth is not linear, and you need to have grace with yourself to not think it should just be like this. There might be a linear trend or an upward trend, but it's not going to be perfectly linear, and you deserve to be okay with that. Forgive yourself and move on and learn from that. And if you love Loved this podcast and loved learning from Courtney, and maybe you want to have her as your very own coach. She is a rock star of a coach. <laughs> then you can go ahead. There's a lot of goodies in the description box today, but her inquiry link will be in there. You'll be able to get on a free call with our enrollment advisor and see if you're going to be a great fit for Courtney and be able to start working with her and making those steps towards being able to improve your nutrition and learn about the why behind what you're doing so that you can have the sustained results that you want.